Welcome Against the Tide Media. I am so excited today. Uh, this is a different take on entertainment that needs to be seen. And what I mean by that is The Chosen has got second season. Let's all celebrate that. That was our intent. That was our hope. That's why we're doing all the things we're doing for The Chosen. But guess what? Now today we're going to switch some gears here. And we have Brock Heasley. Brock is both writer and director of an absolutely stellar, amazing story called The Shift. And we're going to be discussing it today so you can understand why we're supporting it, what can be done to support it, and celebrate what Brock and his cast and crew are trying to do as well. Brock, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. I'm a huge fan of The Chosen. Uh, so it's awesome. I mean, I'm seriously honored that it's against the tide to be willing to support the shift in this way and have me on here. It's fantastic. Well, we consider it an honor. I mean, and on a personal note, I've seen the uh, the 20 minute short that you've done. I don't want to call it a short because it's so dense and there's so much in there. It's almost like a mini movie. So short <laughs> is not working for me. So, but I've seen what you've done. So here, right out of the gate, I got to ask you, Brock, I got to ask you this. So watching the shift, I have to say what came to mind immediately. I am a huge C.S. Lewis fan. Um, mm -hmm. And the screw tape letters is one of his masterpieces. So Absolutely. you're, you're the writer of the script, correct? Yes. But so as yes. the writer, where did the story come from? And what were your influences to find that narrative? So the screw tape letters is definitely top of mind. Like that was a huge influence. I first read that back in high school and I'm a, I'm a huge admirer of C.S. Lewis, just the way that he thought about Christianity and, and the things that he wrote. You know, the shift is the story of a man who's having just about the worst day of his life. You know, his marriage is going bad. He's about to lose his job and then he gets into a major car wreck and he wakes up from that and there's this man helping him and that man turns out to be Satan and Satan is there with a job offer. And so the film is really just like kind of like a job interview between the between Satan and, and our main character, Kevin. And it's all about whether or not Kevin is going to take the job. And so in that sense, screw tape letters came in handy because the screw tape letters is all about a, a, a head demon uh, writing letters to an apprentice demon. And you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound very Christian. Like it sounds kind of evil. But when you read the screw tape letters, you understand exactly the game C.S. Lewis is playing. And what he's doing is he's, he's exposing the tricks. And so the whole thing is told from the point of view of somebody who practices the art of evil. And by doing that, C.S. Lewis is able to expose the tricks. He's able to expose how Satan works on us, how evil works on us, and how it tricks us to get away from God. And so by having Kevin have, a, have an encounter with the devil, by actually hearing Satan say, this is what I want to do, this is how I do the things I do. What kind of work is that? You know... Lie, cheat, steal, murder. I've never hurt anybody my whole life. No, but you have such potential. You're a halfway decent guy. It's the other half I'm particularly fond of, and it takes over in the end. We're exposing the tricks with the shift. We are telling the truth, as I like to say, we are telling the truth with lies. By hearing it from Satan's own mouth, we completely expose everything that he does and it's just very apparent um, that, that it is a trick. And then the other part of that, besides the screw tape letters, you know, the Twilight Zone was a huge influence, huge influence in the terms of the way that I structured it and the way that I thought about, you know, how the ending would, how it would twist um, and what we would leave with. I'm a huge fan of comic books. So there's some sci-fi and some comic books in there. Um, and then also, you know, there's been a lot of stories in fiction about man versus the devil, right? We see a lot of those narratives. And I've always been very frustrated with those narratives because I've never seen a character in, in any of those stories handle the devil in the way that I would as a Christian, the way that I would as a person of faith. They never do what to me is the most obvious thing in the world to handle somebody like that, to handle being actually faced with the devil. And so the shift was my way of working that out, of, of, of responding to those stories and saying, no, this is how it should be done. This is how you should respond to the devil. And Kevin, he struggles with that before he gets to that point. Um, and, and we showed that struggle in the, in the film. But it really is about how do you, as a person of faith, how do you get out of a spot like this? What do you do? What is your recourse for something like that? Yeah, I'll tell you something. Um... That's what makes it so compelling. 
I love what you're saying about the tricks, the tricks of the trade, and that there is an absolute agenda with evil, that evil is operating mm-hmm. in a certain way for specific reasons. And I sense that in this 20 minute, like I said, not a short 20 minute movie where you're moving in directions where you're actually going to, you know, probably explore all sorts of stuff in the world of temptation. But right out of the mm-hmm. gate, it was absolutely amazing. So, look, you're also the director. Yes. You're the director. I see reminiscent. I see M. Night Shyamalan. I see The Twilight Zone. I see Hitchcock in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, even kind of hints of the ominous presence of evil that in uh, David Lynch's uh, Twin Peaks. I mean, I just see all sorts of stuff that you're messing with. What films influenced you to find that tempo that goes all throughout the 20 minutes? There's an ominous, you can feel, you know what I mean? You mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I'm a huge fan of Twin Peaks too and, and of David Lynch's stuff, you know, and you're right, it has, Twin Peaks especially, which I just rewatched recently with my daughter, it does have this kind of ominous feel. And, you know, Lynch's stuff, it's kind of low rent. Like it's its really simple what he films and, and you almost don't even really understand why you're kind of unsettled as you're watching a, a ceiling fan spin its blades. You know, why is that ominous? But it is. And that was definitely very much uh, an influence and a feel that I was trying to evoke with the shift, you know, and it's a faith film. It's like, why would you want it to feel ominous? And I think when you watch it, it'll make sense. A lot of pretty much the caveat to everything I'm saying here is watch the film and it will make sense uh, because it is it is a different kind of film. Um, but uh, yeah, Shyamalan, Hitchcock, you know, tension, suspense. These were the things that I wanted to have embedded in the film, not only because it's basically two guys talking and how do you make that interesting? Well, my way it was was to inject it with tension and suspense so that you're kind of hanging on every word and you want to know what happens. Um, and, and you're kind of afraid of what's going to happen and maybe something bad is going to happen. Uh, and that's kind of the feeling that I think that I try to put into the whole, into the entire film. Um, when I was making the shift, I had just come off of a year working with a production company that had a horror film come out, um, from Blumhouse, uh, just that previous summer. But when I thought about, you know, how do we tonally, how do we construct this? I was really thinking about horror films, which is an odd inspiration to have for, for a faith film. And I'm not, actually, I'm not really much of a fan of horror films. It's not the genre that I seek when I go to watch, you know, a movie on a Friday night. And so my instruction to my sound designer and my instruction to my composer was think horror, think horror. Let's put some stings in there. Let's put some things that ramp up the tension. Um, because we are dealing with evil. I don't want to, you know, get into the evil. I don't, I, I want to make an appropriate film that can be watched by families. But at the same time, I, I want to have a certain feeling. And so when it came to the editing, when it came to the sound design, when it came to, you know, just the visual language of things, I was thinking in terms of horror two guys sitting in a, in a, in a diner, just talking to each other. I think that's what part of what makes it kind of compelling, even though it's on the face of it, it's, it's a very, very simple thing. And I also have to give a huge shout out to my, to my director of photography and my crew. You know, this was my first film. I'd never done anything like this before. And they very much helped me um, evoke that feel and, and keep me on, on point and, and make it what it is. So huge, huge hats off to them as well. Honest question. Mm-hmm. So the shift, would you say it's taking personified evil seriously? It's actually absolutely on saying, here's something in our reality that works in specific. It has a construct. So I'm thinking mm-hmm. about Ephesians 6. And Ephesians 6, mm-hmm. a great letter where Paul, and the early on, I think it's in the second chapter, he said, for it is by grace you've been saved. Uh, not by work so that no man can boast. That's the, 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 the centerpiece of Christianity uh, for, for Paul's general letter to the church of Ephesus. But at the end, he, in, he finishes, it's only six chapters long, with mm-hmm. principalities and powers. That comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Watching this, I think of a machinery, almost industrial. And I think of it as devoid from emotion, but it has an agenda and it's going to meet it Whatever it has to do to destroy, there's no issue ethically from, I, I love the, you know, the dialogue between them. You don't feel like uh, the character of Satan is struggling with any kind of ethical concerns. You know why? Because mm-hmm. he's not. That's not, not a construct in his being. So mm-hmm. what biblical truths uh, helped influence and shape 
the narrative. And the narrative is really muscular in this. So I have to ask that because I think that you probably went to the Bible and said, what am I playing off? Mm -hmm. Are you right about that? No, you're absolutely right about that. So in constructing the narrative and, and really in constructing the character of Satan, because you know, as as the writer, I'm I'm faced with the task of actually personifying evil, of, of actually writing the words that he says. C.S. Lewis, when he wrote the screw tape letters, he talked about how he absolutely never wanted to do that again because just the just the writing out of 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 that dialogue and, and those words was was taxing for him. Um and so it was an interesting exercise to, to go through and try to give voice to things that honestly, I don't believe in at all. I don't believe, you know, that we're doomed and that everything's terrible and, and, that, and that the things that he's saying are right. But by giving voice to it, we're able to instruct. And so what I looked at in the Bible was to look for similar instances. Where in the Bible is Satan being given voice? Where do we hear from him? And what does he say? And why are we being told? what his words are in that moment. Because the Bible is the word of God. And yet some of the words of the devil are in the Bible. Um, and one of the big touchstones for me was Matthew 4. You know, when Christ is being is in the wilderness and he's being tempted by the devil and he comes to him with three temptations. And the third temptation he's given, and, and I'm assuming this was face to face. We don't have any reason not to think, to, to not think that it was. The third temptation that Christ is given, the devil says to him, worship me. And I'll give you all the kingdoms of earth and all the, and, and, and all the, my glory, essentially. Um, and of course, I'm thinking, well, why in the world would Christ want that? His kingdom and glory is so much greater than anything on earth. But that was the temptation. A temptation like that to Christ, he was able to overcome and he, and he went on his, his way. A temptation like that to a regular person like Kevin, worship me and you can have all my kingdoms and all the glory you could possibly want. You do accept this offer. You're out there, Kevin, doing my work, and you're rewarded for it. You're, you're a captain of industry. You're a leader. You're, you're a Hollywood producer. You're a king. And I can provide all of those things for you, everything you ever wanted. I have a thousand different versions of you on a thousand different worlds doing my work, and they aren't hampered by an unfaithful spouse or an idiot supervisor who can't recognize their talents. Swear allegiance to me, Kevin and I will lift you out of this embarrassing farce you call a life and into something glorious. You can do that? Just say the word. It would honestly be my pleasure. that's a strong temptation. That would be something that would be very, very tempting for people. And that's essentially what the temptation is in the shift. Um, but what's most interesting to me about Matthew 4 is how that ends and what happens to Jesus after he refuses Satan and says, no, absolutely not. I'm not going to do that. And what happens in the very next verse? Angels come and they visit him and they support Jesus in his weakened state, they are there to, to support him and buffet him up and bear him up. Jesus receives a witness after his trial. And that's really key for me. That's where I feel like the ending of the shift, especially, and you know, if you haven't seen it, I'm not, I'm not trying to try not to give away the whole thing, but the ending of the shift is to me, biblically sound in the sense that we have a character who is, goes through a temptation. He goes through a trial and then he receives his witness. He receives that when he receives that support that he that he longed for because he shows his faith. Well, it's a fantastic moment in in the the narrative structure. Look, uh, going back to when we we started the interview, um, very first interview that we did for Against the Tide Media uh, in promotion of the Chosen, which we're still going to be doing. Um, they got second season. We want them to have seven or eight seasons. So we'll we'll continue. Absolutely is I had the privilege of uh, interviewing uh, Giovanni Cairo. Uh, welcome, Giovanni. So Thanks. glad to have you here. Yeah, man. It's good to see you. I'm glad to, uh, glad to talk to everybody. And yeah, Who is a great yeah. actor. He's become a really good friend who plays Thaddeus. And we talked about this, and this is something I, I want to hit kind of hard with you. Mm -hmm. uh, as you're a faith-based uh, filmmaker, is that 
generally, when you look at um, Christian entertainment, let's put it that way, okay? Movies, mm -hmm. are, movies fall into two camps. They're either, they're really designed to, uh, they're designed for the believer. They're to mm -hmm. entertain the, the people that are already in the, in the camp, so to speak. And I'm not, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything necessarily bad about that. And I talked about this with Giovanni. This was back a while ago, the first interview. And then there's other filmmakers that are trying to kind of tell stories a little bit outside the box, where they're mm -hmm. trying to find stories that maybe could infiltrate the, the camp of the non-believer. Where does your, where does the, the shift fall? So that's an interesting question. And it's one that honestly, when I, when I made the shift, I wasn't really asking myself. The shift came from a pretty pure place in that sense. It was really a place of, hey, here's a story that's on my mind and that I really want to tell. And initially, it was just the idea of, can I even write and direct? Um, because I didn't know if I could. And so I made the shift very much as a, I don't know if anybody's ever going to see this, but it's in me and I need it to be out of me. And so I made it. And then I took it around to... Um, festivals, film festivals, and almost entirely secular film festivals. And in fact, it was from a secular film festival that I got um, an award for Outstanding Filmmaker of the Year, um, huh? just based purely on the shift. Um, yeah, and it was it was a moment. It was it was a really cool moment. And, and I had several other moments like that where I would take it to these festivals where it's not, there's no other film there that expresses any kind of faith. And yet my film was accepted. People were enthusiastic about it. Um, and sometimes they were enthusiastic on the level of, well, that was really interesting. It had a faith element and other people just completely ignored the faith element and just were like, that was just a really cool story. And I really enjoyed watching it. Um, in fact, I had, uh, one woman, um, on Facebook recently, she saw it on, on our website and she commented and said, well, she had some, actually some not so nice things to say about God. Um, she does, takes a pretty dim view of, of religion and of God in general, but she had, some really nice things to say about the shift. And she watched the whole thing and she was very upfront. And she said, to be honest with you, like, I, I'm not a, you know, God and, and I, we're not, we're not really there, but this film, I hope you get to make it. I hope you get to make the full feature because I want to see it. I want to watch it. And what's significant about that to me is that whether or not she knows it, a seed has been planted in her. And that's what I think that this film can do. That's what I know that the short film has done. And that's what I think that the feature film um, would, would do all the more, which is it would reach those non-believers, those people who maybe would never walk into a faith-based film, but they would love to see a cool science fiction film, a cool Christopher Nolan type film, you know, that they can, that they can enjoy with, you know, on, on the level of it's just a great story and it's, and it's interesting. But at the same time, I very much feel like this film uh, if it's going to be embraced by anyone and, and, the, and the people that I have seen who embrace it the most are those who have faith because it speaks to something within them because it came from a real place within me and it came from a real place of faith. And so when they see it, they see so much more than, than people who don't have faith or who maybe have a dim view of faith than they're able to see. One of the things that's happened as I've gone and, and shared this at churches, for example, is um, we'll always afterwards, you know, we'll have a, a little, Q and A session and get comments from the audience, and that's always fun because I'm always curious how they're going to react because the shift is really different. You know, the, the big quote in the chosen, my my favorite quote from the chosen is "Get used to different," uh, which is a lot of people's favorite quote. And I feel like the shift is is the different is is one of those different things. The chosen is, but so is the shift. And so when I bring it to churches, I never quite know how they're going to react. And what's actually been really cool is that the reaction has almost, no, actually it has been entirely uniformly positive um, in a way that I didn't expect. One of the things a lot of people say is, you know, this isn't like a Hallmark movie. I hear that so many times. This, is, this isn't a Hallmark movie, you know, as though a Hallmark movie is the only thing a faith movie can be. But for some people, that's what they're used to getting. You know, these, these, these cute, comforting Hallmark movies, which have their place. And, that, and that's, I'm, not, I'm not knocking those and, and people enjoy those. That's fantastic. But this is not, that's not what the shift is. And that's not what the chosen is. And so there's a real appetite there, even for people who are watching the Hallmark movies that reinforce their faith, there's an appetite from them even to see something different, to see something that's maybe a little bit more challenging, goes a little bit deeper, um, and that can be shared with people who don't believe like them um, comfortably without any reservation at all. And, I, and that's really what I'm trying to do is, is make a film that is 
a crossover in that way, in the same way that I feel like The Chosen is. We're just doing it with a completely different type of film and a different tactic. Well said across the board. The thing that resonates with me is uh, the honest appeal that evil is real and that, and we talked about this in one of our conversations on the phone, that Christianity is a struggle. And I think mm-hmm. it's like your friend that has issue with, with faith, you know, from the get go, mm-hmm. the idea of uh, a portrayal of it where it's an honest depiction of the, the thorny brambles ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and you know, like you said, Hey, Hallmark, Hey, Hallmark, that's what they're doing. Um, right. I for them personally. Uh, um, but you know, they've got, they know what they're doing and people that that kind of entertainment has its place. But I really think they're it, what you're trying to do with the shift, I think is absolutely essential because there are people out there that are going to see this, that are going to go, I can't believe they're being so honest. I mean, the, the, the chosen is mm-hmm. that's their hallmark. They're like Jesus of Nazareth. It, it's his ministry, but it shows the backstory and the right. struggle and, and the confusion and the humanity of it all down mm-hmm. to Jesus himself. Um, and, and it's incredibly honest about that and its approach. You know, these, these are real, it, it treats these characters, not as characters, but as real people with issues like we have. And that, that's what's impressed. Sorry, I just interrupted you, but I'm, I'm a fan and it's, it's an amazing show. Listen, the people want to hear from you. They don't really want to, I, you know what I do? <laughs> my goal is to hit uh, a speaker view and get away from this. So that's my goal. But anyway, no, don't, don't worry about that. But I see in the shift, you're doing kind of the same thing. Look, when Kevin leaves the diner and this isn't gonna, this isn't ruining everything. This isn't a spoiler. And the door just slowly shuts closes mm-hmm. it's about six seconds. I actually counted off. Um, I want to know that I want to know where he goes. I want to know why he goes there mm-hmm. and what happens now without divulging too much of the script mm-hmm. is the rest of the storyline as compelling as the first 20 pages. Um, more, a lot more. Um, the short, it's kind of, it's funny cause it's kind of, it's hard for me sometimes to talk about the shift because to 99% of the world, the shift is the short, but to me, it's not anymore. To me, it's, it's the full feature film, which, which I've written and gone through several drafts of. And the short is such, is so much the tip of the iceberg. It really is. It really represents kind of the first of the, the end of the first act. You know, the full film is so much more and it takes those themes that that the shift is just kind of hinting at. Some of the ideas that the shift is just that the short film is just hinting at and it takes them to their logical conclusion. Um, it, it, the feature film really, really is a riff, a, a modern day riff on the story of Job. That's that's what it is. And if you're familiar with the book of Job, then you can kind of guess, maybe not to me, it's obvious where it's going and, and, and what the feature film will be about in the feature film. And I'm not going to give away a whole lot, obviously, but you know, one of the central things in, in the short is, is Kevin and his wife, Molly, and kind of the, the argument is the whole thing starts off with an argument between the two of them in, in their kitchen. That's great, Kevin. Way to take a stand. I'll just, I'll call the bank and tell them that you're too. Just turn it off! And then you kind of just don't see Molly again. She's just she's just kind of gone after that point. Um, she's talked about, but she's gone. Hello. Hi, honey. Where are you? Um, I'm all the way home. Look, I'm sorry about this morning. I... I'm out with friends. I'm not sure when I'm going to be back. A feature film. You're going to see their marriage. You're going to see how they got together. You're going to see what drove them apart. And, and in that sense, the film becomes kind of a love story uh, about the two of them. That, that's really a, a big part of what the feature film is. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely going to see what happens to Kevin the second he walks out that door. I, I'm like you. I, I want to know what happens to him. Where does he go after he leaves that diner at the end of the short? And so we're going to see that. And I think the thing that's important to realize about that, and, and I think the end of the film hints at that, is that it's not over for Kevin, not by a long shot. In the same way that for you and I, just because we have a witness of faith or just because we have a moment of clarity that God is real and, and we have a moment where we say, I'm committing myself to, to Christ and, and, and I'm committing myself as a believer, 
that doesn't mean that it's over for us at that point. That doesn't mean it's just smooth sailing and we're not going to be tried anymore and everything's going to be great. It's the same way for, for, for Kevin in, in the feature film. It's, it's far from over from him. There's, there are other trials ahead of him. And that's what's worse is that he's... That's when the battle begins, right? That's, that's when the battle really begins. It's battle. not when you, when you come to your moment of faith. It's, it's after the moment of faith. And the problem with Kevin is, is that he just really ticked off Satan. Father in heaven, are you, way too are you praying? Last heard from me, but I'm <laughs> really here. Here there this is, is amazing. Please, please, I love it. Please. Do you really think that God will help you after what you've done? You're tainted goods. You're not even worth his effort anymore. And even if he does help you, do you think I will ever leave you alone? Ever? You can't put me off. I am relentless. I am at your heels. I know you. He ticked him off. He proved him wrong and he ticked him off and he made him mad. That's not a great thing to do if you want to have a happy, carefree life. And so Kevin is, he's in for it. And like Job, Kevin's going to come to a moment where he says, God, where are you? Where are you right now? Because I'm really having a hard time. And, uh, and that's what I want to show in the feature film and show what happens to a guy that goes through that, who's really just kind of going to get pummeled. And, and is there any way for him to be back with his wife? That's one of the big questions he has is, can I, can I be restored in my marriage? Can I be restored to God? Is God gone now? Or is he still there? And is there any hope for me at all? I'm getting teary just thinking about it. I mean, just, I'm just so excited to tell this story. Brass tax. I mean, think of it. What's the biggest thing we probably have going in the United States right now is the destruction of the family, destruction mm -hmm. of marriage, relationships broken left and right. I mean, something to look at. How does yeah. that work? What are the, you know, is it just social construct? Is there something more going on? So look, right. off to both your cast and crew. I just oh, yeah. big like, woo, you guys, right there with you. You guys nailed it. Um, how did y'all come together and how long was your shooting schedule? I mean, how did this, and what was the logistics mm -hmm. like making the film? So um, the, sh the film was shot over three days, uh, not consecutively. We, we shot on weekends and it was right around Christmas. We had to actually had to skip a couple weekends just because everybody was busy. Um, but it came together pretty quickly. Uh, we, uh, all of the, the entire cast, with the exception of like two people, um, came from a haunted house. We'd all worked a haunted house together. Uh, and, um, and it was at the end of the last night of the haunted house. One of the, I was the house manager. So it was my job to just, you know, I did timesheets and did all kinds of crazy things. Um, and just ran up and downstairs and it was, and just managed everybody. So I knew everybody and everybody knew me. And at the last night, uh, one of the actors came to me and he said, Hey, I hear you're a writer. I'm an actor. If you ever do anything, I would love to be in it. And to that point, I hadn't thought about that, really. I hadn't thought about me making something and somebody else starring in it. I was working with a, with a production company, but I hadn't thought in that direction. And so as soon as he said that, a light bulb went on. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I know all these actors. I'm working with this production company, so I have access to a crew. I could put something together, and I could actually make it. And, and that was how that started. And the, the actor that, that's, that approached me and said that, was Gregory C. Tharp, who plays Kevin in the short. And wow. I did not know at that time that Greg had only ever done comedy. I had no idea. I had never seen anything he was in. He was just an actor who was willing to act. And I said, you got the lead. And he did such an amazing job um, and really blew away everybody who, who only knew him from comedy. Um, if I had just seen his comedy stuff, I may have been a little bit more reluctant, but I, I just had faith in the guy and I knew he could do it and he did. Um, and then, uh, and then Travis Clough, he, he plays Satan. Travis was a, was a friend and, uh, also, um, the directors, uh, he, one of the directors of, of the film, the production company I was working for, uh, he was one of the directors of, of the film that had come out that summer, but he's also an actor in his own right. And I just, I saw him as Satan. I asked him to do it and that was it. Um, and then everybody else, uh, Tina, the waitress, uh, the, the, 
uh, CJ Leonzo uh, uh, played uh, the, the boss Brendan there in the very beginning. He was from the haunted house. And then because it was a cheap location, we used my house for the kitchen. And I used my wife as the wife, uh, Kevin's wife. She plays Kevin's wife. Um, so it was really just kind of a ragtag crew of people. We got together uh, over you know three days in, in, in December. And, and we made this film for $500. That was all the money I had. Uh, I was very, very poor at the time. My wife and I had lost our jobs the year prior and still we're having a hard time. Um, so I had no money and I had a lot of friends and a lot of friends who were willing to, to help me out. That's basically how that film got made. Wow. Wow. Amazing. I'm so glad you made it. So I have to ask, so favorite scene and hardest scene to shoot and why? It's the same scene for both questions. The scene that was the hardest to shoot uh, and, and my favorite is definitely the diner scene, which is the bulk of the film anyway. It's Satan and Kevin talking to each other and everything that happens during their conversation. That was a, that we did that all in one night. It was a 14 hour shoot. It was a 14 page scene. It was stressful. It was hard. It was way too ambitious. My naivete got the better of me that night uh, because I really did not know that that was a bad idea to shoot that many pages in one night, but it worked out. It, it really worked out. We were, we were incredibly blessed that night. We actually, I had worked for a month to secure a location, just the perfect location for that scene. And four days before we were set to shoot the location pulled out and I did not have a backup. And I was really freaking out because anybody who works in film knows that scheduling actors, scheduling crew, scheduling a location, all of that, uh, is is difficult and, and you've got to line up everybody's schedules at once. So everybody was ready to go except for that location now, which which would just mess up the whole thing. Thankfully, we we found a new location within a matter of a couple of days. They came through. We showed up at the place in the afternoon. They literally tossed me the keys and said, here you go. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. They tossed me the keys and they walked out the door. And I locked up later that night when we were all done at five in the morning. Um, little things like that happened a lot on that shoot, things that should not have happened, things that, um, if you had told me ahead of time, they were going to happen, I wouldn't have believed you. Nobody just gives the keys to their restaurant to somebody they don't know, but that's what happened. They, they trusted me. I, and, and I can only look at that as a blessing. I can only look at that as this film from the very beginning felt like something that needed to be. And here I am years later trying to get funding for, for the feature film. And I feel exactly the same way. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So next steps. I mean, how can the fans, and I can only imagine um, our, of course, our, our big push here is to bring people into this and they're familiar mm -hmm. in the 20 minute. Um, how can the fans help? Uh, what can be done on social media? What can be done to move the process along uh, farther or further? And and furthermore, um, mm -hmm. but you know, Bit Angel, you have there's a relationship you have with them. I'm going to let you talk about that because I don't specifically know, and I don't want to say the wrong words. And also, mm -hmm. Dallas Jenkins, who is the, you know the creator and the mm -hmm. director and writer of um, the Chosen, is a fan of the Shift and gave mm -hmm. you a big thumbs up. Uh, and I can only imagine the fan base is going to grow exponentially. Our goal is specifically to bring stuff like this uh, to people out there. We did the same thing with The Chosen, and we're going to continue on with The Chosen. But we, you know, I, I've had long talks with people that are enamored with this project. How do we help you? Yeah, first of all, Dallas, um, you're right. Dallas is a fan. He, he was kind enough when he didn't know me at all to take a look at the film um, early on when I first started my relationship with VidAngel. Uh, and he was kind enough to look at the film uh, and, and watch it and give us a fantastic quote uh, from him. His, his endorsement is on our, our website um, at studios.vidangel.com slash the shift. And um, he was just, he was really kind. He, and he since then, um, we've, we've had some talks here and there, and he's been kind enough to share his thoughts on the film and, and his support. Um, so that's been amazing. And it's such it's such an honor for me personally, because I'm such a, uh, an admirer and a fan of his work. And I think his stuff is just top notch um, and exactly where Christian entertainment needs to go. Um, VidAngel 
came on board when I, you know, I saw what they were doing with the chosen and I saw that, that there was a, a call that went out for, you know, additional projects. They, under their vid angel studios arms, they were, they're interested in, in producing more quality projects under their banner. And so I submitted the shift really just with the intent of hoping to get it on their website so it could stream and I could make a little bit of money. Um, because up to that point I hadn't made any on, on the film. Um, but once they saw it, uh, their thoughts were a lot bigger than that. They, they scheduled a call and they basically asked me, is there more? Can you do more with this? Can we do with the shift what we're doing with The Chosen? And I said, yes, um, not, not a TV show, but I have a great idea for a movie. And subsequent to that, I went on and, and wrote the script and, and that's all done. But at the time, I just had an idea. But it was enough of an idea. What I pitched to them at the time, they felt was strong enough that they wanted to go forward and go ahead and, and throw their weight behind the shift and you know, set up a crowdfunding for the shift and set up some marketing to let people know about it. And so that's what's happening. And that's what we have right now is that we have a website that's dedicated where people can go and they can watch the film. Anybody can watch the film for free on the website. It's also available on Facebook uh, right now. You can check it out on our Facebook page at Shifty Film. And yeah, and on the website though, um, studios.vidangel.com slash the shift, you can watch the film and you can also invest uh, in the same way that people invested uh, with The Chosen. And thankfully with, with the shift, we don't need you know, even half of what The Chosen got. Um, we need about a, about a tenth of what The Chosen got for their first season. And, and then we'd be off to the races and we'd be making this movie. Um, so the best thing that people can do, honestly, um, we, we do need investment. We do. Uh, we need investment and, and we need to, um, you know, get, get that budget. But if people can't invest, then I'd encourage them. And even if they can, we need this too. We need it from everybody. We need, we need to put the word out there. We need it to be shared. We have our page on Facebook, anything that's there, please share it with everyone. Come and see what we're doing. Um, if you can't invest, uh, you can always pray too. We can definitely use your prayers. We need to pray right now. My prayer is, is that this can get the shift can find its way to people who who can invest in it and, and who can support us in that way um, so that we can make this film. Uh, and I, and I believe strongly that that will happen. I believe strongly that there are people out there who want to see a story like this come to the screens. And that's really the ultimate goal is let's get this in the movie theaters. You know, let's let's get this to where people can see it and then streaming from there and, and all kinds of things. But ultimately, you know, I know that this is in God's hands. Ultimately, it's on his timetable. And I believe strongly that his hand is on this project. Um, and if I didn't, then I wouldn't be doing it. But ultimately, that. it's it's going to be up to him whether or not it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So listen, yeah, all this is. uh This is important. It's important stuff. And I would love, like I said, I'd love to see the conversations. Uh, derived from the shift uh, where people are talking about it, uh, you know, uh, talking about the reality of personified evil in, in mm -hmm. certain terms. So then, of course, big question for you is uh, mm -hmm. this, let's see, how do I ask this appropriately? Um, uh oh, I'm scared now. The, the sci-fi twist, mm -hmm. sci-fi twist. How did you come up with that? And does that play all the way through? And furthermore, I mean, I mean, I dig it. I love it. Uh, I love sci-fi coming into supernatural realm. Did you think it was risky to do that, or how? Did, I mean, when when you brought that in, because it because it's almost mm -hmm. a character on its own, really. Mm -hmm. uh, how did how did you feel about that? So putting sci-fi, science fiction, putting that into a work about faith. It's not something that I have really seen before. Um, so in that sense, I knew it was a little bit of a risk because it's, it's what's, what's the template for that, right? Where has that been done and, and been done successfully? Um, nowhere. I haven't even seen it done unsuccessfully. So unless there's something I'm not aware of, it's, it's new territory. Um, and that, that's where we talk about it being different. That's probably the thing that makes the shift really different is that there is this science fiction thing in there. And when I tell people that, they look at me like, what? Like, it's, it's a confusing thing. How does that work? How can you put science fiction with faith? Aren't those, aren't science and faith, aren't they, aren't they opposites? Aren't they supposed to never come together? Um, and at which point I say, just watch the film. Watch the film and then tell me if you feel the same way after, after you've seen it. The, the comment I get most from people is, 
or an interesting comment I get. My mom has said this. Um, a lot of other people have said it. I don't like sci-fi, but I like this um, because there's something different happening. We're using the sci-fi element in a, in a different way. Um, but where it came from was that I was out of a couple of things. First of all, without giving, I could, we keep saying this, but without giving too much away, the sci-fi twist is that it deals with parallel universes. There's not a thing you can imagine that doesn't already exist somewhere, some when. There is no fiction. Parallel Earths. So good. So good, so good when he gets it. And this idea that our choices put us on, on a path, but, but another choice would have put us on a different path. And those paths are represented by actual parallel universes, actual places, actual other Earths where our lives played out a different way. And Satan is able to, let's say, manipulate that idea to his advantage to tempt us and to try us. And I'll let you watch the film to figure out how, how he does that. Um, he's pretty, he, he, he lays it all out a lot better than I could right now. But um, the idea for that came, honestly, it was, a, it was a really small moment. It was me driving to work, listening to the radio, listening to this morning show, these morning show DJs I always listen to. And the DJ I liked the most was not there. He was just gone. And there was no acknowledgement of the fact that he was gone or that he was ever there at all. And I had this moment where I thought to myself, am I in some kind of weird parallel universe where this guy just doesn't even exist anymore? Like, am I going crazy? What is happening? And there was this confusion that took over me. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting. I'm so confused and I'm so put out by this, this DJ who's just gone, which is ridiculous, but it was what happened. It was what my mind went to. And I thought, that's interesting. What if, what if that could be weaponized? What if you could take the confusion of suddenly being in a place that looks like where you're supposed to be? I'm, I'm here, I'm driving to work. It's what I do every day, but it's not like I thought it would be. And that's confusing to me. And what if you could take that and you can mess with people that way? And you could put them in situations where they're having a disagreement over what's going on because they've come from different places where two different things happened and they come together thinking they're both from the same place. It's very that abstract, sounds so, but that sounds that's what it is. Fantastic. It sounds so fantastic, but I actually think probably there's more truth to that than fiction. I really do. You never know. You know. We know that the, there's different levels to reality that we don't experience. We just don't, there's different dimensions and all that kind of stuff. I just mm -hmm. like the fact of actually bringing those two genres together they collide together, but it seems to be cohesive. It seems to mm -hmm. work. And I think that that's one of the strengths of the storyline. So I was just, thanks for the, that was a really good answer. I mean. <laughs> I'm glad you thought so, because I was like, oh my gosh, what am I even place, saying at this really point? It's a tricky place to be, because here's the deal. We want everything neat and tidy, and reality is not. No, it's not. not neat and tidy to any degree. So here, here uh, uh, we, have a, we have a tradition with against tide media we always let our guest have the last say and the question is simple what one thing would you say to um those who are supporting this the fans in the coming days mm -hmm. so the first thing i would say is first of all thank you for giving the shift a chance you know anytime somebody takes the time to watch it that's always impressive to me because i know it doesn't fit into what we think of as faith entertainment. And so anybody who gives it a chance, um, and I got to have somebody come away from that and say, oh man, I, I just wasted 20 minutes of my life. People generally feel like that was time well spent. Um, but to take that initial chance, take that leap and say, you know what, I am looking, I'm, I'm going to be open to something a little bit different here and, and something that, that, that could be inspiring. Let's see if it actually is. I feel like that's kind of the attitude going in for people. And so when they make that leap, I'm just appreciative of that. Um, and and, and I, think, I think the other thing I would say, and this is the thing I already said before, which is that God is in charge here. I really believe that. I believe that he's in charge of this project. When I hear Dallas talking about how this is his life's work, when he's talking about The Chosen, he talks about it as this is, this is one of the things that he knows he's supposed to do. That's a very familiar thing for me. It's a very familiar feeling. That's exactly how I feel about the shift. It really is. And, um, and so I know that because I feel that way, that this is coming from a place of inspiration. And I know that it's in God's hands. 
And I, my, my prayer is simply that, um, that it will remain in his hands and that people will come and support it, share it, pray for it, and invest in it if they can. So Brock, I have to just say, thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, against Tide Media, I mean, our, our goal really is to bring, we're, we're trying to bring entertainment that matters to the masses. So, so people look at Jesus differently, look at evil differently, look at, look mm-hmm. at the reality of what's going on in our world. There's a lot of despair and there's a lot of lost people. And movie theaters where people go for truth, unfortunately, they really do. I mean, it's our Virgil, it's our, our Dante, it's our Homer, it's our Chaucer, mm-hmm. it's where the masses go. So. We best, people of faith, best have the, the best stories to tell. I mean, our muse is better than anyone. So Absolutely. So why, so why not do it that way? So, Brock, thank you so much for this. Best to you. Thank you, Darren. Probably catch up with you down the road again. Uh, I would love that. Else, do something else as you move forward with the project update, something like that. But we're, we're behind you. We hope the best for you, and I, I, you know, I personally, I see, I see great days for what you're trying to do. I think it's coming. I think it's coming down the pipe. So thanks so much. You got any yeah. last words? Or are you? I boy, I tell you what, I, I'd rather people just watch the film instead of hear from me. There's a reason that I am not an actor in the film, and I think we've all seen that today. But uh, but please just watch the film. See see for yourself if if, if anything I'm saying is true. I think. And and I and I actually I will say one more thing. I'm going to backtrack on that. I would say pay attention to your feelings when you when you watch the film. I think by the time you get to the end of that, my hope is ultimately there's a witness of Christ there, and that should produce good feelings. And I think that's what happens. And that makes it worth it all, really, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's the whole point. Listen, that's the whole point. Thanks so much, and uh, appreciate your time. We'll be talking to you soon. Thanks, Darren. Hi, my name is Brock Heasley and I'm the writer and director of The Shift, a short film about the struggle between an ordinary man and the mysterious stranger who offers him untold power and fame, a stranger who turns out to be the devil himself. It's a story of great temptation and quiet faith that deserves a bigger canvas. And now in partnership with VidAngel Studios, we, you and I, we have a chance to expand the story of The Shift by turning it into a feature film. If there's one thing everyone always asks me about The Shift, it's this, what happens next? What happens after Satan is defeated and Kevin walks out the door? The answer is a lot. And my team and I are ready to bring that larger story to life. My name is Orlando J. Gomez and I'm a producer on The Shift. The team we've assembled has worked on films for the big studios, including sound designer Brandon Jones, who worked on films like The Gallows, Transformers The Last Night, Christopher Robin, and A Quiet Place. Now, we're ready to bring our talents to a film that more closely aligns with our faith. My name is Kyle Jens, and I am the director of photography for The Shift. Christian viewers are smart, and we deserve intelligent, beautiful entertainment that speaks to our values and does not condescend. Kevin's dramatic journey of faith is going to look incredible. We're planning for a theatrical release and national and international streaming distribution. Reaching our budget goal will allow us to pursue top-notch on-screen talent to give The Shift its best chance in the marketplace. My name is Erin Hazley, and I played the role of Molly in The Shift short film. I can't wait to find out who replaces me. Is it Jennifer Garner? Can it, can it, can it be Jennifer Garner? Jennifer, call me. I'm so excited to bring you the rest of the story of The Shift. I want to follow Kevin out the door. I want to see what happens to him after he's had this incredible witness of faith and he knows it's not going to get any easier. It's actually going to get harder. Kevin will try to hide, holding on to his faith and fading scraps of hope even as the devil keeps coming after him. This is the chance to tell the story of a modern day Job, a person who already had faith and was then seemingly abandoned by God and severely tested. Kevin, like Job, will have to make the choice every day to still believe despite all hardship and evidence to the contrary. That's life as a believer. That's who we all are. We believe and yet it's tough. And there are times when it's way tougher than others. 
I think about the years of struggle my wife and I had towards understanding our daughter with special needs. I think about the time after we both lost our jobs within 24 hours of each other. And we wondered, what in the world are we going to do? And I think about how many good people I know who struggle with chronic illness and children who go astray and more and worse. And in those long moments, knowing that God is real and knowing He exists, and we wonder when He's going to help, when He's going to show His face again. That's what this feature film will be about. A man who has already seen God's hand in his life, and that's when a true trial of faith begins. I don't know a single believer who doesn't know exactly what that struggle is like. And by telling that story, we have a chance to entertain, encourage, and bring hope to so many. Check out the site for more details on how to invest now at studios.vidangel.com slash the shift. Okay, now, this is my recommendation. So, here's the deal. You don't need to use this. It'll be your call. But I thought it might be kind of fun if we opened going into opening title sequence with our little, our little ditty, our little song, um, if I was juggling. And what I mean by that is I'll show you what I mean. And you can see if, if it works for you. But I thought, why not? And plus, look, I mean, how good this shirt looks. Oh, baby. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, come on. Awesome shirt. So I'm going to give this to you. I think it should be quick, short. It's like Galen always says, be brief, be bright, be gone. So here we go. I'll count down. Five, three, two. On behalf of Against the Tide Media, we're so happy to bring you another interview, but this one's going to be a little bit different than what we've done before. And guess what? What do we mean by different? Well, here's the deal. Why is Darren juggling right now? Well, I'm juggling because I'm happy because there's a shift in my understanding. And what we're going to do basically today is... You didn't see that. Just edit that. We're going to talk to a man that is amazing as far as a filmmaker, both writer and director. And we're going to do that right now. Bam. Okay, so something like that, even though I just, you know. <sighs> so the thing is, I was going to do here. Let me show you. This is kind of cool. I was afraid that I might. I just bought my new uh, my new iPhone. I was afraid I might break it. So here, here we go. Ready? Dang it! One more time. I'm gonna get this. Put this in slow mo. Ready? That's not slow. -mo. That's not good at all. One more time. Take seventy eight. Take seventy eight. Oh. oh, oh. Oh, boom. Take it to the bank, brother. Anyway, tell me what you think. And I'm going to go take a shower and probably need a doctor. Boom. Yep, I am recording. Cool. Well, I am too, and I am in gallery view. I am too. What about you, Darren? I don't know. Um, I'm in, no, I'm not in gallery view. Now I am. Uh, I was in speaker, you know, it switches. It's the mm -hmm. opposite. Thing. It, you know, the funny thing is when it says, uh, no, you're not, you can go to speaker view. Um, so we, I've got recording going on and things look good. I see three participants and things look all right. I, I'd probably be okay. Even if you did bomb me, but, uh, <laughs> but I appreciate I appreciate the effort to have as good as an interview as possible because it does it does help to know ahead of time. I've, I've definitely done plenty of interviews where I didn't know at all. And it is this? Plus, we know Noah's going to edit it and make <laughs> it great. The important thing. The juggling right? was great. I love that. It's juggling, and I think that that's what's going to make everything perfect. Now. Just messy. <laughs> Now, Darren, I can't juggle. Look here, here. You want me to juggle with these? I have two water mugs. Two water. Well, do that. 
you're gonna have a professional career. So. <laughs> yeah, break so, uh, break I could guys juggle in a half hour. You could both be doing three, and I and I mean that. Anyway, it's a whole other discussion. Probably probably wouldn't be of great interest to our audience right now. Hey, <laughs> teach you how to juggle. Woo. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to get it to where I just don't glow like a cadaver. That's a little better. Yeah, I warmed up my light, hoping that that would not make me so ghostly. Yeah, I have my lighting right in front of me, but I didn't bother to turn it on because it's, I'm not <laughs> in it anyway. <laughs> and that's fair. Yeah, I don't turn this thing on otherwise because okay, it's no, kind of blinding. Okay, no, you don't have to do anything. We get it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, basically... Just to let you know when we get into this, number one, mm-hmm. Brock, you know this, if we mess up, big deal. Uh, you sure. Know, we can take it out. Let's try and get, let's try and hit it right as much as we can. But the Absolutely. thing, the thing is, is that I gave you the questions. I'm probably going to play off them and, and embellish and ad lib a little bit here and there. For sure. I, I'm not an actor. So if I read them verbatim, it's like watching the shift, the straight tape letters by C.S. Lewis, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, like wow, this is boring. So I just look up for a reminder and then kind of and kind of go for it. That's the sure. way. I do. So anyway, so bye, Noah. <laughs> okay. You want to be in the you want to be in the midst of this, Noah? Do you want to be? How about you? You can be on this if you want. I mean, maybe you could well, add stuff. I well, I don't think it'd really be necessary for me to be on it. But it would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up for whatever. <laughs> Hmm. Except, you know, it says recording. No, it's blinking red. Does that mean it's doing it? Um, is that if I mess up, we got it on the other side? I think that's um, what, one yeah. thing you can do to make sure it's recording on on your end. You see at the bottom where it says "pause, stop recording." Let's see. Don't click it. But, I do. Um, yeah, then that means you're recording from your end. Great. Hey, uh, hover over at the bottom. You can see that. You just, just don't touch it. Yeah. So if re- you've got the record- if you've got the red light blinking at the top, you're fine. Okay, it's the recording is blinking red at the top. Mm-hmm. I go in. It says record on this computer, but I think I'm already doing that. So do you? Oh, want me to- I think that means that just the other people. Are recording in the meeting. Okay, let me see. Let me see. Record on this computer. Oh, shouldn't say. Re- oh, now it says recording, and it's okay. Thank you. Okay. You. Oh, great. Yeah, definitely. um, glad I did that. So I did pull a Nick Shakur, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nick loves me anyway, but that's just the way it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've done that. I've done the whole shoots and then, oh, cry, we didn't record the sound. It's terrible. We had that a little bit in our first interview with Giovanni. Uh, I did get the updated version with no music. um, And it was just kind of trouble playing over this um, kind of gentle music. And it sounded a little bit weird if you really listen closely to it. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Got it. Got Um, it. Trouble is not gentle, I'm sure. No, it's not. It's just kind of whimsical. and. <laughs> <laughs> For you guys to see this film as something worthy of promoting, like the way you're promoting The Chosen, I mean, that just, that blows my mind. That's just so exciting mm-hmm. and humbling for me. So I appreciate it. Well, it's good. It's that good. So. Mm-hmm. All right. Listen, Noah. Thanks for all you do, Maestro. Go crazy. It's done. Thank you. I know, I know you're doing multiple stuff right now. Okay, I am going to let you guys get to this, and appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. Right. Thank you, Noah. Bye. 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 Looking forward to watching this. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. So, let me figure out this whole speaker view. That's hard. I have to press that button. Oh, okay. So I'm going to pull this up a little bit. I'm going to move your head as close to the center of my computer as possible so that I'm looking at you and it looks like I'm looking at the camera. Yeah. There we go. Looking at the green light. I just, I just don't like that, but that just seems to be the deal.
uh, you know, when I'm looking at you right now, does it look like I'm looking at the camera or that I'm looking down below it? It looks like you're looking at me. How did you do that? So I reframed my zoom and, and, and then kind of so that it's, so that you're as close to the top border as possible. And then I centered your face with my green light. So it, so basically your face is about an inch away from the camera now. So it looks like I'm looking straight at it. I like that. I'm, I'm cheating though. I have the questions uh, in a word doc behind the zoom. Uh, menu. Oh, I have that too. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got the zoom. I got the questions right next to your head, but I can see you and I can see the questions. Okay. Um, well, let's see, let's do this. So I have a tendency to move. So I have to, oh, you're good. I got to figure out if you could see me, I'm like my, my foot's hooked into the desk. <laughs> <laughs> anyway <laughs> no no uh uh but yeah let's just do it so so here we go so we're recording so noah um here we go i'll do count five four three two one welcome against the tide media i am so excited today thank you darren i'm a huge fan of the shift i'm sorry Wow, I already screwed up. Let me back That's up. Right. No, right. Just go back. One, two. Thanks, thanks, Darren. I'm a huge fan of the chosen. It's just, it's the it's the answer left. Yeah, you go back into the uh, garage there in the laundry room. So this is this is gonna still this is gonna be garage. That's just gonna be there. We're ready. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. All right. Sound ready. Mm-hmm. Speed. Cameras. Whoa. Camera speed. All right, the shift, scene one, take one. Mark. I don't mind at all. What we'll do is we'll just keep going. Noah, uh, we're, we're doing questions one and two, correct? Um, let me bring. Yeah, him. he's Noah isn't on. Well, yeah, I'm just, I'm saying that. So I'm making. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, let's see here. So interview questions. He, he makes things look so much better. I've seen so. Yeah, many. I've interviewed. I trust him. Oh, my goodness. And then I see it and I'm like, that's not so bad. Hey, I <laughs> feel it. You know, that's all the special. Yeah. Things, okay. So, um, all right. So you ready here? Second. Yeah. This, I'm going to get this in position really quick. Drop that in. Got it there. Pull this down. Okay. No. So I'll just count off. I shared my bacon with him. Some bacon right here. I don't want to know your name. <laughs> well done. Well done. Thank you. Keep going. Thank man. you. Keep going. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, brother. Sounds good. All right. Bye. Leave meeting. Boom. All right. Sign and leave. No. Assign and leave. Why would I assign a, assign a new host? No, I don't want to sign. Are you being able to just leave? I don't want to leave. Are you way too Are you praying? <laughs> last heard from me, but I'm <laughs> really here. Here there is This is amazing. Please, 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 I love it. Please. Please. Do you oh, really me. think that God will help you after what you've done? You're tainted goods. You're not even worth his effort anymore. And even if he does help you, do you think I will ever leave you alone? Ever? You can't put me off. I am relentless. I am at your heels. I know you. And if I am you are nothing. Nothing. That I may be nothing. Tomorrow, I am greater than God. Jesus Christ. Shut up! <laughs> Shut up already! <laughs> <laughs>